I'm so fucking excited. I have a casting tomorrow. I'm also kind of nervous. Um, jumping right in as usual. Um, these past few months have been so fucking great. I feel like I really have, you know, jumped into all of the things that I've really wanted to do. Um, that whole adage or concept has really been raining heavy in my mind that I have one life to live. And it just, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I consciously did any of this stuff either. It was very subconscious. I had experienced something pretty traumatic a few months back in addition to like kind of a breakup situation. Um, so it was like double homicide <laughs> on my emotions and it propelled me into what I'm doing now. And it's funny because I mentioned that in the last podcast, how that happened a couple of years ago and I was mentioning how I like prayed or not prayed or like wanted something humbling to happen again for me to get back into active mode. And it happened again um, but more, it, it was hard. I, I think I had my Saturn return. And if anyone who's not into astrology doesn't know what that means, uh, every, I think it's like 20 years, Saturn returns. And essentially the things that you like, I guess you'd say have dealt with throughout life um, or like the general, uh, how do I describe this shit? Something that like you've always kind of struggled with becomes extremely magnified at that point and you're kind of forced to once again confront those fears or those you know bad characteristics or whatever the case may be it's it's a very negative it's not it's not a negative process but it can be very deep very emotional very depressing um but it's almost like certain things it just resurfaces essentially and you kind of just have to work through that and learn whatever lessons need to be learned and boy did i <laughs> It was so heavy. And at that time, too, I was trying to, like, stop vaping, which I haven't talked about that on the Internet, but I'm just going to say it because, one, I think it's better that I admit it and, you know, start the process of trying to veer, veer it out of my life because I truly hate the fact that I do it. Um, but anyways, back to what I was saying, I, I went through a lot, threw myself into a bunch of projects. And I just started doing everything that I've been wanting to do. Because I felt like for a while I was kind of, I was more so stuck in thinking mode for the longest time about all these things and that I wanted to do, whether it was creating uh, content. I still want to make YouTube content, but social media in the grand scheme of things, not just TikToks, but, you know, I've, I've always wanted to vlog. I wanted to do a podcast. I wanted to, you know put more music out. I wanted to model and I've literally been doing everything in addition to other stuff too. And so now, granted, there ha there was a specific goal that I was trying to achieve. So one of the projects that I'm working on, that I literally, I, that was more conscious. I was like, I have to do this because I, I need to make more money with the things that I want in life. Like I need money for them. And that hasn't, it, it, has, it has been a huge blessing and I have been rewarded and I have accomplished things in it. So I don't want to sound, you know, I don't want to not acknowledge that. I'm very grateful for that. I will admit, though, that it ha I haven't achieved the goals that I set out for. And if I'm being even more honest, it's because I have been, you know, dipping my toes in so many different fucking ponds at the same time. If I was able to go balls to the wall with that one thing, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would kill it. I'll admit, when it comes to that, I'll just say what it is. It's UGC. Um, I'm still getting the hang of streamlining my workflow to be able to make more ads because here's the thing. I, this may sound boring to some of the people listening. If you're not into UGC, most people don't. It's not like a general thing that I think is talked about unless you're just in this industry or this part of the social media industry. But, you know, UGC can be so many different things. It can be just a voiceover and different B-roll shots, but even that can take a lot of logistics. It could be something a little bit more eye-catching and entertaining and quick and fast-paced um and you're talking through it and you, you got a ton of edits it, it could be your face isn't in it at all and it's so funny because being on that journey has been interesting because there's a lot of successful UGC creators that will give advice and make it seem as if what they say is law but then you know the industry will tell you otherwise <laughs> which is just it's just been such a journey it really has um but it's been fun and it has been very stimulating for me. I mean, I started making videos when I was like 14. I started editing. I, I learned how to do, do the jump cuts. I started using iMovie. Like I 
that seed was planted a long time ago and it was something that I knew I was passionate about years ago. So it feels amazing to finally get back into doing that shit. I love it so much. Um, but I will admit it is hard sometimes for me to like get up and do it sometimes. <laughs> like any, all of this stuff it just takes discipline and it's all involved me pushing myself despite the fact that like I get overwhelmed at the concept of, you know, creating it. Because here's the thing. When I first started my journey, when I tell you I was so fucking focused and so in there and like laser focused with it that like I would plan it all out the night before. I screen wrote everything. I wrote the scripts. Like it was great. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that have happened in my life that I also was expending time towards that like I, I can admit that I feel like I kind of was losing gas or am losing a little bit of gas. So I'm trying to like kind of refuel myself um, and just push past that. But yeah, when it first started all this stuff though, I was just coming out of a really, really depressive episode. And one of the things that happened to me, like that traumatic event that happened, I like opened up to someone about it and... That person, it was a man. He's the only man that I've told. And that reaction was, it was so cold and like apathetic that I was just like, wow. And ironically enough, the same person was involved in some other reasons why I was depressed. And I was just like, okay, this phase of my life, like I need to phase some people out. You know what I mean? Like for good. Um, And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just like, I'm in a new chapter, you know? Um, and if anything, it was like, okay, accept this. And this new phase is so much, is so more, so much more fun and exciting and different and interesting. And it just feels really good to kind of change the tune of things. But, um, at that time I was also trying to like get off vaping. I think I mentioned that earlier. And every time that I try to stop vaping, I fall into depression really bad. I don't know if it's withdrawals. I feel like that's such a dramatic word for nicotine but maybe it is, but I always get severely depressed and I always happen to be on my cycle. So I'm like fucking cramping and crying. <laughs> like, I don't know what the hell is going on, but yeah, it's just a thing. Um, but speaking of addictions, <laughs> so I have a couple songs out, right? About alcohol, liquid courage and liquor store. And here's my thing. So I didn't start drinking till I was like maybe 20, I want to say, 19 or 20. And, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I like didn't even really party that much. And when I did, I didn't drink. And then one time I drank and I was like, oh, my fucking God, this is amazing. Now I see why people can't go to parties without doing it. And it's funny, too, because I used to lie to myself and be like, I don't need to drink to have fun. But like I wasn't having fun, dude. Like I I did need it because once I did, I was so lit dude I was happy and I was having fun and so for a chunk of uh freshman year you know I'd go to parties here and there I never did it during the week it was always like on the weekends and it wasn't like every single weekend but I think things started to pick up more sophomore year but I would go in and out of drinking I noticed I remember that I would go in and out of party phases I'd say because that would be the only time when I would drink and I didn't start experiencing hangovers till like maybe like 21 Actually, I had my first hangover for my, nope, I'm getting my numbers all mixed up. I think that was my 20th birthday that I had my first hangover, which was crazy. But anyways, um, alcohol has been an interesting situation in my life. And as I said before, I would go in and out of phases. And I think I think it was kind of a transfer addiction because I remember I, I smoked a lot of weed at one point. I did summer cleaning and that was the first time, like a little bit before that, I had smoked with like a guy that I was seeing at the time. And then I started smoking it with a friend that I had met in summer cleaning. And that started me on a really bad spiral because the guy that I was seeing before that whole um, time in my life, which was pretty close in timing. I'm all over the place in this episode. My brain is like scattered as fuck. It's late at night. I have to get up early, whatever. Anyways, um, I'll never forget that this person that I really, really liked at that time, we were at some sort of kickback gathering thing, whatever. And he looks me in the eyes and goes, I hate that you're straight edge right now. And because when you like a boy or you like someone, you put way too much value sometimes, at least when you're younger years 
on their opinion of you. Um, and it was, it's so funny looking back because if someone told me that now, I'd be like, well, I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I'd be like, I'm unattracted that, you know, we're not on the same page, you know? But at that time, I was just like, oh my God. And, and that was kind of the start, I think, of me just doing certain things that were very out of character just for the sake of acceptance, which is so sad. But at the same time, it's not sad. It's a part of the journey for me. At least it was for mine. And so I smoked a lot of weed for a while. And I would just kind of go back and forth between smoking a lot of weed and drinking. And then it became both. And it was just gross. (laughs) Just straight up. I don't think, okay, here's my, here's my thing. And this may be offensive to some people, but this is my podcast. I'm going to say it. I don't, it is what it is. I think that Smoking weed can be medicinal. In a lot of cases, it has been. And, you know, I've definitely been in phases of life where, like, I've resorted to doing things that probably weren't the healthiest just because I was depressed. You know what I mean? Like, that just wanted some sort of relief, aka smoking weed, aka drinking, you know? And so I try not to be like, I had, there's definitely some empathy there when it comes to that. But now I'm at the phase of life where, to, if I'm being a thousand percent honest, I want, I don't want any of the friends that I have to smoke it. I think (laughs) this is going to sound so mean, but I think it's disgusting. I think it stinks. I think the blunt stinks. I think it's unladylike and it's hard because in this city, I mean, everybody does it. I don't want to say everybody. That's not fucking true. A lot of people do it. It's very, it's like a part of the culture, but I think when I think back to my younger years and how it just slowed me the fuck down, I don't give a fuck if it's sativa, indica or whatever. I just think it's a disgusting habit. And I also feel the same way about vaping. Like the fact that I do it, I'm disgusted with myself. So I can only be so judgmental. But the difference is that there's not like a lingering, ashy, blunt smell. And even if you're if you're not smoking a blunt, I'll be honest, I think it's the blunt smoking that disgusts me. Because if it's a person that might do like edibles here and there or like a pen, it's not as... For some reason, I just don't see it as, 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 as gross. <laughs> But otherwise, it's just, I think it's gross. I think it makes your lips, it's just nasty. Like, I think it's a nasty habit. And I was talking to my mother the other day about vaping and how I'm like, that's a disgusting habit too. Like, I'm just like putting my mouth on this fucking vape every so often. Like, ew, like I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not cleaning it. I'm just being honest. I don't fucking clean it because I don't even think to, but I should be, you know, like that's disgusting. It's probably grosser than smoking a blunt. No, I wouldn't go that far. But, um, damn, this is like such a long tangent on fucking blunts and vaping, but I really wanted to bring it back to the alcoholism. Um, for me, I have a very interesting relationship with it. I think that there were times in my life where I drank when I was sad, but to be honest, it was more so just to kind of like provide some sort of like dopamine I guess like have a little bit of fun because the times when I had drank earlier in life it was like fun but when you're drinking and you're alone and you're depressed it's not fucking fun it just it's it's a way to somewhat lose your inhibitions but you're still depressed if not more you know what I mean and um I'm at the point now where when I drink I'll admit like Here and there, I can drink to the point where I'm like, okay, I got a little buzz, I'm good to go. But a lot of the times, dude, I will like drink a little bit, I'll feel kind of tipsy, and then I'm like, I need more, I need more, I need more. And it's not to the point where I need to black out, I've never blacked out. But there is this weird like thing within me where I'm like, I want to drink a little bit more. And like doing weird shit, like taking a shot when no one's looking kind of behavior, like that's weird, you know? And I know why my... Social, I don't know if the word for it is social anxiety. I'm honestly tired of fucking repeating myself and even identifying with it because I'm tired of hearing about it. It's over talked about at this point. Like we get it. We definitely have awareness when it comes to mental health and anxiety. I don't think there's any lack of that. I don't really need to add to it. (laughs) But like, I just, when I'm in a social environment, I think that some of me, I guess still, well, I know is still somewhat unhealed and gives a little bit too much of a, fuck about people's opinions to some degree not completely but I've dealt with a lot of abandonment in my life and so I do think that's what I mean when I say unhealed because it's like if you're healed you're just existing as is you're having healthy conversations you're not putting too much value in it but when you do have those abandonment wounds that haven't been healed 
you cling to things, you might succumb to certain things, my mannerisms get all fucking weird because I'm just like overthinking shit, like it's embarrassing. But when I'm drinking, I don't give a fuck as much. So it does, it definitely does help to quell that a little bit. Um, but I've noticed too that when I drink now, sometimes I can get a little sloppy just because I think I'm subconsciously and inadvertently trying to fill that void. Holy shit, just talking this out right now is like, like I knew it, but like to say it out loud, I'm like, damn, you know, like th- th- this is like a moment of just kind of an epiphany shit. But I'm supposed to be uh, tending to some Halloween duties, not duties. What am I saying? I'm going to some Halloween events. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's sober and I, he's the only friend that I have who's sober and uh, asking him for like advice, kind of like, how do you avoid the peer pressure? And I think a lot of adults around this age are just like, well, if I don't want to drink, I'm just not going to. Yes, you can definitely, obviously I will say no, right? And in some scenarios it is very easy, but in others you have a person that's constantly asking you and once again, that unhealed piece of me, I think succumbs to it. But I've noticed too, I can be like out to dinner or like out to lunch with some friends and like someone will drink something and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to drink. And then I have this fucking urge and I'm like, wait, well, I'll just take a sip. Oh, I'll just order a drink. Oh, you know? And I'm like, what the fuck? They're not even doing anything wrong at this point. I think that it is a combination of my unhealed shit and also who I'm surrounding myself with. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, it's fucking poison. I don't give a fuck, right? And I also notice, like, as we get older, you know how, like, you hear things about, like, the, the wine mom or, like, the, the mother who's secretly an alcoholic but try to keep it under wraps but goes to AA every week. Same thing with the dad type shit. Like, you get older, adult responsibilities start to pile up, and that becomes your source of relief. It becomes a lot of adults' source of relief. So it, it, And it's also very normalized. And I noticed... There would be times, like in, like last year, I would be like drinking champagne at my house and I'm like, oh my God, I'm turning into a, like a wine mom almost. I don't have kids, but like this is how it starts. Like I'm not, I used to drink socially. Like what the hell am I doing kind of thing, you know? And so when I started noticing that kind of behavior, I'm like, oh my God, like I'm seeing how it snowballs. And it really, there really is no nutritional benefit and not saying everything you put in your body has to be, but, oh, geez, like, the hangovers are also so much worse when you're older. I've definitely found things to thwart that and to pretty much keep that at a minimum, though, because of the things that I do the night before or the night of drinking. So it hasn't been completely terrible, but I notice that it slows me down so much. Like, I'll be like, oh, I'll just drink for the night and have some fun. And then the next day I, I might have a slight headache. I'm not as willing to get out of bed. My sleep was shit because you can't, you, it's impossible to get quality sleep if you're sleeping on being drunk. <laughs> like, and ah, if it was up to me, I would be surrounded by people that have the same values. Like they don't drink and they understand the, the complexities of it and they have fun in different ways. They find other forms of stimulation And it's not involving something that is damaging to your body. Like, you know, and I think that the people in my life, we're all at different stages and we're all kind of excelling in different ways. Um, So I don't want to sound so harsh. I'm not fucking perfect my damn self. My diet isn't perfect. I vape, you know what I mean? I'm still trying to get further off when it comes to financial stability and things like that. So I don't want to speak as if I'm coming from like a hierarchical standpoint, but the concept of proximity is more powerful than I think people realize or give credit to. You do become who you surround yourself with. And so I've noticed that there's certain people in my life where I'm like, I don't know if I can hang out with this person that often because they're kind of lazy or like they, they're not, they're not doing the things that I want to do. And not in like a selfish way, but in like a, you're going to drag me down. Like I can just see it. Cause when we get together, there's no, it's, uh, you know what I mean? Like, there's no progress being made. Not saying that every relation, every every conversation has to be about progress, but you can just tell. I don't know. I'm just more selective now. I really am, and I think back to my younger self and how I just didn't give a fuck. Like I did, but not enough. I cared more about what others thought, and I let myself get really bad. And guess who was there to save me? Nobody. None of those people that I was, you know 
changing myself for were there for me at, at my lowest. I, I, brought, I, I dug myself out of that hole. And so when I'm around certain behaviors that trigger that old self to come back, I just, I automatically am thinking I worked too fucking hard to, to get out of that shit. I worked too fucking hard to not be that person anymore. And nobody was there other than maybe like my mother and me. <laughs> like no one. Um, ooh, I get emotional just thinking about it. That shit was hard for me, bro. I, ooh, and I don't want to talk about it in a victimist way, but just like it really hits me sometimes where I'm like, I have come a long fucking way. And so when you encounter people that, you know, might be at a different phase of life and different part of their journey that are so, they're just not there yet. If I don't want it to be like even a conversation of me trying to convince them to do anything because it's not my place for one. I just want to attract people that are already trying to do it. You know what I mean? I don't want to have to like, you know, force you to do anything because one, I'm not your mom, but two, like it's, I'm at a point now where I'm just uncomfortable with that shit. It's like, you need to help yourself. Cause, and I think maybe the reason why I think that way too is because I did, like I helped myself out of my shit, bro. It's not to say that I didn't have any support at all, but for the most fucking part, (laughs) it was me and it was beautiful. But, you know, I also am trying to remind myself too, that like not everyone is meant to, to be or do the things that I am meant to do and be. You know, I had seen this really beautiful motivational video from, I forgot her name. I think Rhonda Burns. Damn, it just came to me. Um, Black woman. She was in the movie The Secret. And she was talking about how it's like, I don't know verbatim what she said, but something about going through the door and you're trying to take all these people with you. But it's like that door was fit for you to walk through. It wasn't meant to like fit all these fucking people. You know what I mean? And it's the same case for them as well, you know? And you can look at it good or bad, but either way, people's journeys are what they are and then, and based off of the decisions that they're making. So it's just hard because I'll have these really kindred connections with people. And I think that that's somewhat of a test from, I don't know if it's God, angels, the universe, but it's like, I will love the fuck out of people sometimes that I meet. And I'm like, damn, like, I love this person. Like, they're funny. Like, I can be myself around them but they're just going in a different direction career-wise or health-wise or whatever. And I'm like, fuck, this is, mm, like, I can't hang around you that much. Like, I'm going to, this is going to fuck me up. This is going to fuck up my life. And it sounds selfish, but honestly, dude, you fucking have to be. You have to be selfish to some degree as an adult if you give a fuck about yourself. If you love yourself, if you respect yourself enough, you have to. And I think as I've gotten older, I recently started to have this kind of mindset where it's like, I'm protecting myself or I'm protective over myself, almost like I'm my own child, as weird as that may sound. And you know how, you know, you might see like a protective parent with their kid and they're like, oh no, she's not, I'm not going to allow her to go to that. I'm not going to allow this for them. You know what I mean? Because you know that it's for the greater good of their well-being. That's how I view, view myself. Um, and it's, it's such a deep concept. I don't know if I've heard anyone else say that or talk about that in that way, but that's how it feels to me personally. Um, And maybe that's why sometimes I get a little defensive because if you think about the parents that are protective over their kids, you know, it's almost like a mama bear sometimes. Like I'm kind of like that with me, but I still want to maintain my diplomacy and I still want to maintain being calm and, you know, level-headed. But I will admit that I get disgruntled at certain things because I'm like... Like, don't you want more for yourself (laughs) so we can, you know, be on the same page? Like, imagine when you're surrounded by people that have a progressive kind of mindset, that is like a superpower, okay? Like, you are like a super, like, what do you fucking call it? Like, superheroes as a group, you know? Like, you can accomplish so much shit and just feel amazing. And is your life going to be perfect? No, but at least you're going in a direction that is making you feel better overall for yourself, you know? Um, but once again, I do still have empathy for things because I, I have experienced the depression and like resorting to shitty, beh- like, you know, habits to quell that. And it, it really is such a visceral thing for you to have to want it. You have to fucking want it for yourself. You have to want it bad enough. And there's been some people that I had distanced myself from and 
that's a whole nother thing, but not because I didn't love them, but I just realized this isn't going in the direction that I need it to. And I think to some degree it might have hurt them in a way, but sometimes it's necessary to propel them into their journey. You feel me? Like someone that left me recently in my life or that I had to cut out. That whole situation was horrid and not horrid, but like depressing. And it propelled me into doing all the shit that I'm doing now. You see how like everything is happening for you, not to you once again. It's all about perspective and what you choose to do with these life experiences. Not everyone gets to a point where they're tired of complaining and just want to change finally. Some people just stay stuck in that forever. And that was their journey. And that was what was meant for them. And that's just what it is. And then uh, there's other people that just don't think like that at all and just keep it fucking moving. And then there's other people where they hit a wall and they're like, okay, I can't keep fucking complaining anymore. I can't stay in this place anymore. I need a change and I need to do what it is that I want to do in life. I think I'm one of those people. I'll like expend energy on it and then I'll transmute it into like project mode, whatever that may look like. Um, But It's just been hard because that's one of the things that I've been trying to work on is not being overly judgmental and critical because I know that that can definitely veer on being toxic. But the reality is you do need a certain level of discernment, you know, within your mind consciously to be able to protect yourself. I think it may, maybe it goes back to primitive things where you know, fight or flight, you know, and how your brain is trying to, or how you're just instinctively trying to protect yourself from certain things and you have to be able to judge circumstances for what they are. I think I go a little too hard sometimes with it, but it's necessary. I think for me, I feel a bit of guilt for some reason. And maybe it's because I do have these kindred connections and because I know what it's like to be in certain positions and I don't want to abandon someone because I also know how that feels. So I feel sad simultaneously while making these decisions but I had like this I guess vision earlier or like something just kind of popped into my mind download whatever you want to call it of um, a person putting a baby or a fish or whatever into water and this baby doesn't know how to swim and they're kind of like no like save me save me like what are you doing you can't just drop me in here and in one scenario they immediately learn how to float and swim and in the other scenario they drown and then just this whole concept of thinking like in that scenario obviously if it was a a parent and a child that would be really fucking horrific but more so from a bird's eye view of the fact that you have to make these difficult decisions sometimes right and it can either work in that person's favor or it can go in the opposite direction but either way if you obligate yourself so deeply to everyone If anything, you're going to be the one to drown, you know, and you kind of have to suspend that to a healthy amount, not to the point where you're completely selfish and and considerate, but suspend that like attachment to a healthy amount so that they can also make their own decisions, sink or swim. But you can't hold so much weight on yourself in terms of like, you know, feeling like you are the culprit for it. And, you know, you are the reason for all these things and it's all on you and you're the biggest villain in the world. The reality, too, is most people, I think we get caught up in ourselves and our own shit. But nine times out of ten, even if you were a very important person in that person's life, there's so much other shit going on in their life, good and bad. It's really not just about you. I mean, they could have a lot of weight in their mind towards you, but, you know we have so much going on in our lives. You can't even give yourself that much credit if you think that you're, you know, causing that much of a difference, you know? Um, But you just, you have to let people swim. You have to let them either learn how to swim or drown. And this whole idea too of being that savior is somewhat narcissistic, which I'm realizing more and more, this whole God complex of it all. Like, it's really not my place to save people. And it's a tough pill to swallow because... I have been in a lot of scenarios where people tell me like, oh my God, you say exactly what I needed to hear. Like, it's like certain things will come to me in my mind and it's almost like it's not me that's saying it. It's like spirit is moving through me as weird as that may sound. It's only going to be weird if you're not into spirituality. So if you don't get it, that's fine. If you are, I'm glad you understand. 
But ultimately, I do feel like I have been kind of a vessel for certain people. And I really feel like this connection with them because once again, I like to be there for people in a way that I needed in the past and didn't have. So I think that's probably why I know exactly what to say because, you know, I know what I wanted, so I become it. But that doesn't mean that I stay in these people's lives forever and it doesn't mean that they stay in mine forever. It really comes down to just being there in the season that, you know, was necessary for that time in both of your lives. But you kind of have to just start to, as you get older, you just kind of realize, like, I can't be Captain save a for everybody, you know? Like, I just can't. I think maybe deep down a piece of me just feels like that's what makes me valuable in people's lives, though. But the reality is that's not true. I also, you know, I make people laugh. I do other things. It's not just that. Um, but that whole God complex and feeling needed can veer on narcissism a little bit because it's a little bit like... I wouldn't say it's disingenuous in my case. Like, I do genuinely be caring about people a little too much. (laughs) But if you look into the complexities of narcissism, which I'll go into in another episode because it's getting late and I'm tired, um, that is a facet of it. Narcissism is actually very multifaceted and, and often spoken about incorrectly, I feel like, on the internet. People are very quick to use the term. But... It's really deep when you look into the, the psychology of it. Anyways, as you can tell, throughout this episode, I was really tired. I am tired. I have a casting early, to mo- early in the morning. I need to go to sleep. I can tell I'm drifting. So hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to Introspect Pod. I just changed the name of my podcast, by the way, from WTI to Introspect. WTI was short for, well, that's interesting, but it's just too fucking much and... I had to switch it up. So that's that. But I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It was all over the place. I'll be better next time. I'm sorry. I love you. Have a good day.